um, attend the, the recorded version. Um, okay, I'm dead without, oh, already have some kind of echo. Okay, I will um, otherwise um, hand over to um, Justice Burley and meanwhile, um, I will try to solve the technical challenge. Thank you very much, Liria. It's an honour to be invited to launch this most interesting book. I'd like to begin also by acknowledging the trad traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I am, the peoples of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. There can be no doubt that the subject of this book, artificial intelligence and the legal profession, is topical and immediately relevant. In the federal court right now, people are disputing whether or not machines are capable of being inventors for the purposes of being granted patents. Worldwide, there are debates about whether copyright can vest in beautiful paintings created by computers, and the patentability of business systems run by computers has troubled the courts for some time. But how do you write such a book? It seems to me that the task must have been a bit like trying to explain to a layperson about the reason why you should invest in cryptocurrency. First, you have to take a position about how likely the reader is to understand the technology, and then you have to explain the technology and move to explain why such an investment is worthwhile. I suspect that many investing in it do so because it's funky and new rather than with any real knowledge of the subject, but not so in the case of this book. For Professor Michael Legg and Dr Felicity Bell, the challenge must have be begun with the fact that lawyers are generally steeped more in the humanities than science, let alone computer science, and begin with an explanation of the unruly and expanding field of artificial intelligence. This they have done with care and precision, and in so doing, they expose popular myth and doomsday predictions, and calmly, and by reference to an impressive range of sources, demonstrate that the fears are not as profound as some would have you think. Frequently, there's an emotional response to the words artificial intelligence. What is meant by intelligence and how artificial is it? Does the term refer to machines achieving singularity, augmented intelligence, or clever machine learning? Are judges and lawyers to be replaced by some sort of deep thought computer that can do all that they do on its proverbial electronic ear? Then there is the fear factor. If a machine is developed to be smarter than humans, then that machine can develop even smarter machines that will take later gen later generations of machines to heights that are beyond human comprehension. Perhaps such a machine could solve all of our pandemic, climate change and other problems, but alternatively, could it result, as Nick Bostrom predicts, in the machines ultimately turning us, on a best case scenario, into their pets, on a next worst case scenario, into their livestock, and on a worst case scenario, deciding that we're not needed at all and should be done away with. Uh, for this one might call to mind the story of the sparrows who decided that the world is a dangerous place and that they should enlist the help of an owl to protect them. They managed to steal an owl's egg and warm it until it hatched. Regrettably, history does not tell us what happened next to the sparrows. This book certainly arrives amidst concerns that artificial intelligence could be a sparrow event for lawyers. Certainly, that seems to be what futurist Richard Suskind has been predicting for a little while now. Yet the book does much to calm the horses and remove the white noise that is prevalent in this area. The title contains no misrepresentation, and the book delivers on its promise to explain methodically and clearly what artificial intelligence is at the moment, and likely to be in the near future, and to explain to lawyers how artificial intelligence can be utilised in the service of the profession. The book is richly researched and draws on academic writing as well as contemporary news and social media sources to add verisimilitude to some of the aspects that we've heard about this field. It is informative and well organised and I've enjoyed looking into it, as I suspect will anyone who has an interest in the subject. I doubt that there are more comprehensive works available to lawyers that address how artificial intelligence is used or may be used in legal practice and the future that AI represents for lawyers. Michael and Felicity are going to tell you about the book and our distinguished reviewers are going to supply a commentary to you on it, so I won't do anything of the sort here. But I'd like to touch upon three aspects of the subject matter under consideration in the book that particularly caught my eye. 
first, uh, perhaps naturally enough, but I was interested to read about AI and outcome prediction. Any chapter that has as a subheading what the judge ate for breakfast is likely to attract the attention of a judge. The difficulties of using algorithms to predict the process of legal reasoning based on decided cases and the even greater difficulties of then using those predictions as a basis for programming artificial intelligence to determine actual outing outcomes in sentencing and the like has been widely reported. But I found it was interesting that the French government has made it a criminal offence to publish statistical information about judges' decisions, which is punishable for, by five years imprisonment. The breadth of research that led to that information and others was impressive. The chapter points out that the assumption that a computer will be able to predict the way that I might decide a case is deeply flawed. The quantitative analysis of past decisions runs into the immediate problem that it's impossible to draw into the data set the entirety of the factors that go into decision making, although I don't think that what I had for breakfast is likely to be influential. The analysis relies on the premise that other cases are sufficiently similar to the one the subject of prediction but anyone who has heard a barrister distinguish one case for another from another will realise that one apparently similar decision is usually a pale shadow for the case in hand. It's reasoning by analogy that's persuasive, and just how persuasive it is will depend on the strength of the analogy, which draws into concepts not only the facts of the particular case, but also aspects of policy and purpose when one's considering, for instance, legislation that ranges much more broadly. The role of lawyers will continue to be important to assess and review such material. It was a fascinating chapter to read. Secondly, I particularly like the turn of phrase in the chapter on legal ethics and regulation, where the authors say that AI will have an impact on the law of lawyering, how the legal profession functions and the responsibilities of lawyers. It's a nice way of expressing the, the point set, aside, set out in the chapter exploring the continu continuing role and burden that must lie on lawyers using AI. Of course, AI is merely a tool with many possible uses, and they're enumerated in the chapter in the book and drawn out for those who are interested in following particular aspects of it. But lawyers must not forget their ethical obligation that at all times underlies their function. Computers are not ethical or moral. It will remain the task of lawyers to ensure that the use of computers does not overshadow those obligations. Finally, and perhaps related to this, is the reminder that seems to permeate the book to the effect that law is a profession where lawyers owe fiduciary obligations to their clients and ethical obligations to the administration of justice. These are very human obligations. Computer-based reasoning cannot be creative. It cannot reason by analogy and it cannot take into account the policy and social factors that are so integral to the development of the law. Nor can a computer, interv computer interview a client with empathy and provide advice that takes into account all of the direct and indirect factors that influence legal reasoning. The book rightly points to these amidst, uh, as amongst other reasons, why AI is unlikely to replace lawyers soon. The debate as to the role of machine learning and computers in the context of the practice of law gives rise to the fundamental question of whether the benefit that it provides outweighs any disadvantages brought to the system by the new technology. That, of course, permeates the general discussion about artificial intelligence. Are we better off as a society if artificial intelligence is allowed to have a role in our system of justice, or are we worse off? Of course, the answer is not binary and it's best considered in the light of the nuanced benefits that the technology offers balanced against the disadvantage that they supply. The book provides, in my view, a welcome next step in the continuation of the debate. My congratulations go to Michael and Felicity for turning the pandemic into a positive and producing a book that provides a measured, measured and informative analysis of how AI is likely to be of service to the legal community. From its contents, I do not see it as likely that lawyers will become livestock or the pets of deep thought anytime soon, nor do I see that deep thought is likely to be eating my breakfast in the immediate future, which is a relief. I must now hand the floor to others who will share their far more penetrating insights into the book. It falls upon me to grasp the virtual bottle of champagne and smash it against the attractive hard copy of this book, now declaring it to be launched and ready to sail into your library. 
Thank you, Judge. That was a great visual, actually. I think we could all use an imaginary virtual bottle of champagne smashed against books in celebration. Um, so thank you very much for, for launching the book um, and for your comments um, this afternoon. Um, and without um, any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the authors, um, Dr. Felicity Bell and Professor Michael Legg, who um, are the uh, research fellow and director of the um, Flipstream. Thanks, Lyria, uh, and thank you, Justice Burley. Uh, I might just start by, uh, I guess, providing some background to the book so that people are able to sort of, uh, I guess, understand where it, uh, it came from. Um, in the period uh, 2014 to 2016, uh, there were a number of uh, books and reports which were trying to, uh, I guess, examine the impact of technological pro progress on the, um, the uh, legal profession. Um, and at the same time, we had the uh, mainstream media, which was um, uh, really enjoying itself by dancing on the uh, the grave of the uh, legal profession uh, due to the rise of the uh, the robo lawyer, as it was uh, called, um, which appeared to be uh, some form of uh, low rent cross between robo cop and judge dread um, that was going to make um, access to legal advice and um, legal representation uh, much cheaper than it currently is. Now, um, in the midst of that, in 2016, um, I was asked to be part of the Law Society of New South Wales uh, FLIP Committee and Commission of Inquiry, FLIP being the acronym for the future of law and innovation in the profession. Now, um, the Law Society undertook a um, uh, the inquiry, it gathered uh, evidence from a range of sources and uh, produced a report. Now, that then led to uh, a collaboration between the Law Society and the University of New South Wales in what is now known as the FLIP research stream. Now, the structure of the uh, FLIP stream was that it would undertake research on a major annual topic each year. And so in 2018, which was the first year of Flipstream, uh, the topic that was chosen was artificial intelligence and the legal profession. And so from there, uh, you have Dr. Felicity Bell and I seeking to investigate what the ramifications of artificial intelligence uh, were for lawyers, um, including asking what was unique or important about lawyers. And so from that background, um, the book was effectively um, born. Now, I'll, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll hand across to Felicity, who can talk a little bit more about what the book seeks to do and why. Felicity, you're on mute. It's okay, I'm not managing the technical side of this meeting so well either, so it's good to know that I'm not the only one stuffing it up. But <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, there's something, at least I'm not um, in an online hearing. So thanks everyone for coming. And uh, particularly given that, uh, ironically, what I was about to say when you couldn't hear me was particularly because we're having to do it in an online forum. We were really holding out for a face-to-face -face book launch, but we finally decided that about a year after the book published, it just wasn't going to happen for us. So thank you to the Hub for, for hosting this event instead. So. Michael's sort of given you the beginnings of where the book came from. When we started looking into the area in more depth, we found that there was a lot of scaremongering about AI and the legal profession, and there was also a lot of overgeneralising. So it was sort of AI could do everything and take away professional jobs. AI was fatally flawed and made terrible mistakes. It was seriously overhyped. Um, AI was biased. AI was less biased than humans. So early on, we really decided that it wasn't very helpful to think about AI in this monolithic way. And it, perhaps even more so, it wasn't helpful to think about legal work in a monolithic way either. So the whole idea of the middle section of the book, I suppose, which is talking about the different uses of AI in the law, is to show that they are very variable and contextual. And we felt that paying attention to those specific contexts was very important. 
So that meant that as well as looking closely at the technology, we also needed to look closely at what lawyers actually do. So what is the role of the lawyer in all of these different contexts and how is that role changed in different ways by AI in legal services? Um, so what skills and knowledge do lawyers need to navigate the use of AI in their particular role? And Hopefully it's obvious for people who've read it that we wanted the book to be useful and practical, but we also wanted it to be scholarly. And we wanted it to have footnotes and it does have lots of footnotes to satisfying. Obviously then a key part of the book was also to provide accessible explanations about the technology for people who are not computer scientists or data scientists, which we also are not. And that stemmed from the premise that lawyers and legal scholars really can't competently and ethical, ethically use AI systems without understanding how those systems work, even if it's only to understand where their weak spots might be. And again, there was really a lot of information available, but it was often framed in a very extreme way. So machine learning's cutting edge. Machine learning's been around for decades. Expert systems are dead. Expert systems are contemporary and useful. AI can't do legal reasoning. AI can make predictions of case outcome more accurately than lawyers or legal academics can. So it meant that we were reading material that went from blogs on machine learning right through to computer science textbooks, and we were trying to pull it all together into something which didn't oversimplify, but which was still very readable and comprehensible. And I think overall that that is a strength of the book it does pull together a lot of very disparate information into one place. And it does mean that where we make assertions and predictions about lawyers and AI, these have a basis that is or has been carefully researched. Um, and that leads, I suppose, to the final part of all this, which is the so what part of the book, if you like, which Michael is going to talk a bit more about. Thanks, Felicity. So, I guess where we, we try to come to at the end of the book is to look at um, what is the future role of the profession. And our approach is really um, to be guided by uh, what we've called uh, values. So professions uh, continue while they are valuable to and serve society. So lawyers need to focus on what they can provide that a machine cannot. And so we summarise this through three values. Uh, the expertise value, human value, and ethics value. So lawyers have always needed to have specialised knowledge. Uh, with the advances in AI, the lawyer's expertise needs to include being able to employ AI. They need to be able to use it. Um, but the lawyer's expertise is also derived from their ability to address the novel and the uncertain. Um, it, it's all well and good to train your artificial intelligence on what's happened in the past, but the lawyer, in fact, has to be quite forward looking and deal with things that uh, people hadn't expected to occur. Uh, secondly, legal practice requires a lawyer who can provide judgment, discretion, creativity, empathy and understanding to a client. These are characteristics that are very much human. The lawyer is required to act in the client's best interests. So the lawyer is different from the, the taxi driver, the travel agent or the hotelier that's experienced experience disruption from the likes of Uber, Expedia and Airbnb, because the lawyer-client relationship is not just commercial, but professional and fiduciary. Further, lawyers also owe a duty to the court and the administration of justice to the benefit of society more generally, because they provide institutional protections that support the rule of law and a democratic society. And so in some ways, the, the lawyer is there um, not just to serve the client, but to serve society more generally. And so the lawyer is meant to have interests far greater than simply, um, am I able to provide a service that is going to um, allow for uh, somebody to make money? So these obligations are crucial to what makes uh, law a profession and to trust between the lawyer and client, but also the lawyer and the society. So society needs ethical lawyers for the law to function. As a result, we don't see um, lawyers going anywhere. Soon. Now, just before I um, I finish, I would like to just uh, uh, thank um, a few people. Um, one of the things about writing a book is that it, it, it does take a village, as they say. Uh, 
So I'd like to uh, thank the Law Society of New South Wales for having the vision to partner with the university to undertake this important research. Um, I'd like to thank our colleagues at the University of New South Wales, um, including uh, Dr Justine Rogers, who's the Deputy Director of the Flipstream and has been on this journey with us now going into almost five years. Um, I'd like to thank the Allens Hub and uh, Lyria Bennett-Moses for holding the launch uh, and being supporters of the Flipstream. Um, Justice Burley for his kind words, thank you. Um, and then if I can thank in advance uh, Julian and Beth for agreeing to participate in the launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we have two commentators, as Michael um, foreshadowed, um, Professor Julian Webb, and um, who is um, from Melbourne Law School, um, and Beth Patterson, who's the director of ESP Connect. Um, now, on my schedule, Julian is first, but Beth, you have your hand up, so I thought I'd check if everything's okay at your end. Uh, yes, sorry, I just don't know how to manage teams. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no, that's all good. Um, so um, Julian um, was going to try to um, dial in, um, but it looks like that hasn't been possible and he flagged in advance um, that that might not be possible because of his um, internet connection. But he was um, kind enough to um, send us a video. Um, so I will then play um, what would be um, his remarks. Um, and you'll just have to give me a second because I am the tech person on this. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, that I join you today from the lands of the Warawarung people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to uh, thank here um, Michael and Felicity for their generous invitation to comment uh, on their book today. Um, and it's a genuine privilege to say a few words about this important contribution. Uh, also, if you're watching this pre-recording, I, I have to apologise for the fact that I can't be with you rather more in person than I am. Unfortunately, technical limitations of getting access uh, from the present bit of regional Victoria that I'm visiting have clearly been too much uh, for, for our systems to manage. Anyway, to my topic for today. So AI and the legal profession is a very welcome book that explores its chosen terrain with a clarity and breadth of erudition which makes this book as readable as it is necessary. In overview, the book provides a well-crafted three-stage journey through the terrain. In part one, the authors provide an overview of what artificial intelligence is, how it operates, and how it fits with the role and work of lawyers. In part two of the book, they describe six aspects of legal work where AI is being used to augment the human lawyer. Each chapter here centers on a specific use or use case for AI in legal. Thus, we explore outcome prediction in judicial and legal decision making. We look at um, technology assisted review in litigation, the emergence of online courts and ODR, contract commoditization and transactional law, reg tech and the rise of compliance systems, and AI in the criminal justice system. In part three, the authors pull all this work together by considering first the limitations of AI for law and thence the future of lawyers and the legal profession in the context of this brave new world. In the time remaining to me, I'd like to offer some thoughts that draw chiefly on, the, on aspects of the last two chapters of this book. Chapter 11, entitled Legal Ethics, Liability and Regulation in an AI World, and Chapter 12, The Future of the Legal Profession. I intend to do this by reference to two themes that cut across these chapters, legal ethics and professional regulation and access to justice. And obviously, we're going to start with ethics and professional regulation. 
In chapter 11, Legg and Bell do an excellent job of exploring the key impacts of AI on the law of lawyering, focusing primarily on the big ethical obligations, competence, confidentiality, independence, the duty to the client and the duty to the administration of justice. Drawing comparatively on the ethical codes governing lawyers in Australia, the US, the UK, Hong Kong and Singapore, this section I think offers a significant source of reflection, not just for practising professionals, but for the regulators of legal services as well. The section on competence certainly highlights for me what a minefield for lawyers and regulators this area can be particularly if we ask, as Legg and Bell do, whether the duty of competence extends not just to obligations to use technology competently and supervise its use appropriately within the firm, but to a duty to consider when AI should be used. The challenge for knowledge and education here is readily apparent and a matter to which the authors rightly return in chapter 12. But there is an important challenge for regulators here as well. It's one thing to identify technological competence as a matter of best or effective practice. It becomes another to prescribe it as part of a minimum or um, normal competence standard. Competing ethics opinions in the US are already pointing to this as fertile ground for both over and under enforcement. Nonetheless, as the cost of augmented service tools continues to fall and their deployment becomes increasingly normalized, this is, I suspect, a particular Rubicon that will have to be crossed. This argument say, segues also with Legg and Bell's discussion of the duty to the client. As the authors observe, there is at least an argument that where AI will improve the quality, efficiency or cost effectiveness of service delivery, this is in the best interests of the client and its use is therefore required. This broadly purposive and expansive reading of the duty to the client is perhaps somewhat contentious but it is consistent, I think, with the trends in the quality of service regulation that Legg and Bell identify, and one that I would also endorse. It has some really interesting implications down the line, I suggest, however, in terms of how far the competence and client duties may come to impose on lawyers, something akin to an implied duty to innovate. The other big duty considered here is the lawyer's duty to the administration of justice. Again, Legg and Bell rightly, I think, take a somewhat expansive view of this as to the standards framed, for example, by the ASCR, which deliberately describe this in terms that go beyond the duty to the court as narrowly construed. We're thus talking here of lawyers' obligations to the integrity of law and to the rule of law itself. The duty to the administration of justice, Legg and Bell argue, thus requires us, qua lawyers, to question to you the uses to which we're putting tech. As something of a critical scholar in this space, this is my version of motherhood and apple pie. However, it may not be everyone's. So just how far does it go? To get the conversation going here, let me pose three questions to test your limits, drawing in part on material from throughout the book. So firstly, to what extent do we owe a legal and or moral duty to make inquiries and counsel the client where they're proposing to use a piece of technology, for example, uh, an HR tool that may result in biased or even discriminatory outcomes. Secondly, to what extent does our own use of legal text in contexts where not just the social acceptability but the legality or enforceability of its output may be contested, operate at least in tension with 
or even contrary to a proper reading of our duty to the law. And probably worth saying, actually, examples I have in mind here involve the commoditization and routinization of work, like the production of NDAs and non-competes, in circumstances where automation itself may normalize or even expand their use. And I guess part of my concern here is whether the pixie dust of AI may actually make us less likely to question those outputs. And finally, to my third question. To what extent do we have a moral duty to question and actually resist the use of black box technologies like the compass sentencing tool that have the potential to change the legal system in fundamental and unfair ways? The extent to which many of these issues bring to fore tensions with our duty to the client and our larger but poorly defined obligations to third parties and even society at large highlights what fertile ethical ground the AI debate occupies for the legal profession. Leg and Bell also do us a real service in relation to my second theme, which is access to justice. And here, chapter 11 sets the scene by reminding us both of how relatively thin the duty to promote access to justice is in the Australian de deontology, and by rightly centering on the problematic role played by unauthorised practice of law regulation in this space. Whether UPL rules ultimately serve more as a tool of consumer protection or as an exercise in market control is a very moot and proper question. As Leg and Bell suggest, we probably haven't got the balance right yet. And their book is another important invitation for us to do this work. The materiality of this question, moreover, becomes front and center in the light of the concerns of chapter 12. While chapter 12 does suggest that reports of the death of the profession are somewhat exaggerated, this is a somewhat conditional consolation. The longer term of risk of decline, or at best structural transformation of the profession, certainly can't be discounted. The link here is that our collective response to the access to justice crisis may be a critical measure of that future. And as the University of Toronto's Paul Gowder has cogently argued, our existing corporatist approaches to law tech may be ill-suited to that task. Leg and Bell highlight the case for regulatory relaxation here, referencing the creation, as we're currently seeing in more US states, of independent paralegals with limited licenses to practice in areas of unmet need, and also the potential to use MDP structures to support automated service delivery. These are definitely good suggestions. Are they enough? I'm not so sure. Down the line, I think the industry will need to move somewhat away from the emphasis on individual regulation that we currently have to a greater focus on entity and platform regulation. Those, I think, may be the bigger game changers, particularly in the access to justice space. But whatever we might think the solutions are, I am wholly aligned with Leg and Bell that the legitimacy of the legal professional project is at stake here. As they conclude, Professions exist to advance the public interest. If they cease to do so, then society will abandon them. As this book shows, technology will increasingly offer society other options. We thus need to take Michael and Felicity's parting words very seriously indeed. And it's in this perhaps slightly challenging light that I heartily commend their work to you. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you and with them, hopefully, through many additions into the future. Thank you very much.
much. Okay, that um, worked, I think. So, well, at least no one yelled out at me that it didn't. So, um, <laughs> um, excellent. Um, and then um, for our next commentator, Beth Patterson. Thanks very much, Lyria, and thanks to Michael and Felicity. It's a real honor to, to speak today about your amazing book. And I'd just like to start by saying congratulations to you both for cutting through the hype about AI and law and for giving us an in-depth explanation of what's really going on. As somebody who's been developing and implementing these AI systems for longer than I care to say, um, I highly recommend this book as a must read for both lawyers and technologists. What I really loved about this book, it is that for the first time that I've seen, it brings the two worlds of law and technology together so that we can understand both perspectives um, and why both matter. And I think this has been something that's been missing in the literature for a very long time. I really liked um, uh, in, in part of your conclusion that you talked about what success will most likely be and that we will most probably have lawyers and non-lawyers practicing together, marrying both the humans and the technology, not one or the other. And you do bust that myth that AI will not replace lawyers. And like you, I have been very tired of all that hype. Um, but lawyers will need to adapt to AI. And in the book, Michael and Felicity make it really clear that they will need to actually supervise the use of AI to fulfill their ethical duties of competence. This book has so many dimensions, and I'd like to just talk about um, about five of them really quickly. And again, it's such a much needed book in our industry. Firstly, it's super accessible. It's so easy to read, and you take the complexity of technology and the complexity of law and make it digestible to the average reader. So congratulations and well done. Um, it's very thorough. It goes through the history of both the legal profession and the technologies. And then it talks about what's happening now. And, and as has already been discussed, it goes through the six areas. And that's quite comprehensive and very on point. And then it ends with the future of AI and law, as has been discussed. It also covers the worldwide market. Um, I was so impressed it covers Australia, of course, but the US and Europe and China, um, Canada, et cetera. So it gives us a worldwide perspective. And it covers both common law and civil law jurisdictions. And it's, it's very, very comprehensive. Secondly, it's thoughtful, balanced, and practical. And coming from the tech side of the world, I really liked how you were able to explain the technology in layman's term, terms. And also, I think very thoroughly explain the limitations of technology. So really covers the sort of four major technologies that are used um, in legal, expert systems, machine learning, natural language processing, and deep learning. And it gives real insight into how they work and some of the limitations. But really importantly, it also points out what lawyers must understand. They must understand how to use it and ensure the processes will work. They need to think about what it is doing, interpret the results, which is gonna be a real skill of the future. And it, they need to understand where the limitations and biases might be. Um, they quote Muriel Hildebrand, he says, lawyers need to really consider three questions. What problem does the technology solve? What problems 
are not solved and what problems do technologies create? So when applying the technology, these are the things that lawyers really need to understand. I often get asked, do lawyers need to learn how to code? How much do they need to know? And it feels like it's often an on-off switch. Either they need to learn how to code or they don't need to understand it at all. But what this book really points out is what lawyers need to really do. They need to understand when to apply it and why they are applying it. And they need to make sure they fulfill their ethical duties. Um, the other area on the legal side is they cover very comprehensively um, what lawyers do, how they're organized and how they're regulated. And I found this actually reinforced a lot of what I did know having worked in a law firm for a long time, but I think a lot of what technologists don't know I think it's really easy in the market now to lawyer bash um, without understanding that they actually have a duty to the court as well as a duty to the client, which is quite different than a normal business. And I think sometimes on the technology side of the world, we can forget some of those things. Um, so I thought about the book on the technology side in terms of prediction of a machine. And I'm just going to read a few quotes that I found really nailed some of the issues on the tech side. One is mathematical simulation um, of legal judgment. That's what the AI is doing. It's a, merely a simulation. And in mas machine learning, most patterns are merely correlations amongst vast reams of data rather than causative truths or natural laws governing our world. They're really, machines are incapable of legal reasoning, but they're super good at finding patterns in huge volumes of data, which no human could ever do on their own. Um, but on the tech side with the data, it's really garbage in, garbage out. So one of the challenges for using these tools in the legal world, in the legal profession, is how do you get good data? And there's a lot of work that has to go into doing that. On the legal side, it's really about judgment. And as has been touched on, it's about the human elements of judgment. It's about dealing with creativity and ambiguity and human circumstance. And as a technologist, often we think so logically in black and white, of inputs, calculations, and outputs, where lawyers think of, I've got to write something in the English language that's going to stand the test of time and be interpreted depending on circumstance and where the world is. And these are clashes of cultures. <laughs> um, the, the interesting aspect is this book brought those worlds together and gave perspectives from both sides of the fence. Um, the fourth area that I'd like to highlight is how comprehensive this book is. I was amazed by the number of footnotes. I don't know the total number, but every page is filled with footnotes and it's an excellent scholarly approach to a very hard topic. Um, and finally, I found the book courageous. They didn't shy away from dealing with all the, the complexity of where our market is. They dealt with the unauthorized practice of law. What happens when people can rely on just a machine for maybe lower level legal advice? Um, how are we going to deal with non-lawyers, perhaps practicing law? And they deal with what happens if we would simplify law? Like they take the flip side and say, well, what if law became more simple or more definitive so that maybe we could program it? But there was a great quote, which, which I'd like to share with you. And it's in thinking about, could you simplify law? It said, do humans want a legal system that excludes discretion and humanity? And I thought that really nailed what this book is about. Um, they deal with the liability issue. And, and again, having developed and delivered systems, 
this is a huge issue of who may be liable if the, the machine gives the wrong answer. Is it the training that the lawyers did? Is it the calculation that was programmed by the technologists? These are really difficult um, issues that our market needs to wrestle with. And you've heard a lot about the regulatory side, and, and that's still an ongoing um, debate in the equation. But lastly, I think in terms of their courageousness in dealing with hard topics, they really do nail the need for multidisciplinary teams. That AI is not going away. It will help deliver legal services and deal with some of the issues of cost that the market is having to deal with. It will make law more accessible and provide better access to justice. Um, and I'd like to conclude with a quote from Bill Gates, which I think perhaps sums up um, some of what the book is about. And Bill Gates said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. And I think this book is a wake up call for us all to continue to share and debate these issues. AI will provide better access to justice, but it has to be done ethically and within the framework of how lawyers have been asked to practice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Beth. So what I might do is bring up everybody into the screen and apologies that I am weak at this from a technical perspective. Um, but let's just get everyone back. Um, okay, so um, this is a chance now for general Q&A. So um, if anyone in the audience has a question, um, please raise your hand or you can ask it in the chat and I will try to keep my eyes on both. Be brave. Oh, we have, hold on. Um, Catherine. Yes, Lyria, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. And I apologize that I, I can't be on screen again due to technological limitations, but a question for the authors and panelists, um, which area um, in artificial intelligence um, do you see as the most promising in terms of um, use by the legal profession in the next five to 10 years? Mm. Michael, given you started, do you want to go first? Well, I suppose the, the thing that's, um, in responding to a question like that, I, I suppose you have to start with the areas where artificial intelligence has already been adopted. And so as a result, uh, technology assisted review in relation to uh, discovery in the litigation process, um, and then moving across, I guess, into sort of uh, due diligence in uh, transactional work would be the areas where I guess it has sort of the longest history. Um, and it is, it, it's part of those areas of practice today. Uh, and I, I think what we'll find is that there are areas where, because there's also a business case that supports them, um, that they will continue to be refined and to de develop further. Uh, but the other area which I, I think is, is likely to um, attract a lot of interest is in the online dispute resolution area. And the reason for that is because of the access to justice issue that we've, we've heard discussed. Um, and so using expert systems to be able to provide information to people who can't either can't afford um, afford a lawyer or the dispute that they're in or the, the issue that they're having, the amount that is in dispute is less than what it would cost to access a lawyer, um, want to be able to get um, effective guidance 
um, to be able to help them to make decisions. And so I can see that also being an area which is going to be very promising going forward. Um, but I, that, that's, you know, they're, they're my two suggestions. Does anyone else want to comment on that one, Felicity? Uh, I was going to say, um, I think that in large part that's going to depend on the data as well that's available. So I think at the moment what's holding what's holding it back in a lot of areas is the problematic nature of the data that people can get hold of. And you've kind of seen that recently with Westlaw and, um, and Ross Intelligence litigation. So control over data is going to determine to what uses and and how effectively that those can be deployed so it might not be the area so much as you know who controls that data or who has access to the most data and the most valuable data I'll, and i'll just jump in the other area i agree with with both felicity and michael um in terms of kind of where we're at and what's had the most impact, certainly litigation, which I've been involved in, you know, it saved clients millions and millions and millions of dollars, the application of AI. Um, but the other area that I think is quite exciting is the contract side. So both on um, analysing contracts in a due diligence context, but then actually learning enough and having enough uh, data to understand where the, the market is for certain decisions when you're we're developing contracts. And I think that will grow to be proprietary to legal firms because they will have access to that data at scale, but then also in automated drafting of contracts and where you've got sort of stock standard contracts, I think a lot of that will be automatable. Um, employment contracts, those types of things. And when you get into more complex contracts, I think artificial intelligence machine learning will be used to help put up options of of from the best option to the worst option to your client. Thanks, um, Beth. If unless anyone else wants to add to that one, we've got two more questions in the chat. So first um, is surely there have been many precedents where liability derives from errors or other shortcomings in technology. Why is AI different? I, I, I think the um, the answer is it's not. <laughs> so that um, that I guess creates then the need for being able to sort of say, well, what sort of regime do we put around AI, and um, how are we going to sort of manage that liability? But where that I guess um, becomes particularly important in relation to lawyers is um, the lawyer who wants to use artificial intelligence, I think, is going to be wanting to understand. So what, what am I actually liable for? And um, what might actually be the liability of the, you know, the person that's providing that particular piece of technology? And so that's where I think lawyers have got to sort of, I guess, be pretty savvy about what exactly am I taking on when I use this technology? Um, and indeed, uh, if I'm contracting with my client, as well as with the third party who's providing this, um, I probably need to think about where any loss is going to fall. Uh, and so that's one of those things where I think um, to answer those sorts of questions, that's where lawyers need to get, a, I guess, a better understanding as to what it is that they are using. Um, and the education piece also starts to come in. Um, Thank you. Um, anyone else on that one before I go to the final question? Um, Larry, I'll just jump in on that one again. I, I think there is a complexity in AI compared to other technologies and the other technologies were more predictable in terms of what they were supposed to do and it was easy to find where the problem is and whether it was a technology problem or data problem. With AI, say machine learning, say document review and litigation, lawyers have to train the system and if it doesn't perform or misses a document that's relevant and the case is lost, it's much harder to figure out, was it the actual algorithm that was programmed by the third party vendor, or was it the training data set that caused the issue? And so there's a difficulty in AI in figuring out 
where the fault or the liability might lie. Um, and that's the tricky part with technology. Deep learning is even more difficult. So we had one more question, um, Beth, but um, and it was for you, but we are out of time. Um, so perhaps um, I can ask Natalia who posed that question to follow up with you offline, but it was about the composition of multidisciplinary teams in driving value from AI enabled solutions and legal services and the impact on traditional business models for law firms, which is an important topic, but probably one we can't answer in 30 seconds or less. Um, so I don't know if Natalia, you're happy to post your email um, or Beth to post your email so that that can take place offline. Um, but otherwise, um, if I can thank everybody um, for coming along to this event, I think the book is well and truly and ceremoniously launched. Um, so congratulations to um, Michael and Felicity. Thank you to um, Justice Burley um, and Beth um, and also our remote commentator as well. Um, and thank you to those who asked questions and those who attended for being part of the event this afternoon. Thank you.